you guys. Um, can you guys hear me? They gave me a fancy microphone, but I feel like I can speak loud enough without having to use it. Can you guys all hear what I'm saying? Okay, great, awesome. Um, can we get a round of applause to Miranda, please? <laughs> a lot of courage to get up in front of a bunch of people you don't know um, in front of your peers and introduce the day. So thank you, Miranda, for doing that. Great job. So as Miranda said, my name is Meng. Um, I'm very excited to be here to be your keynote speaker. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank uh, King County Library System, Rochelle, Carrie, for bringing me out here, and also the team leaders that have worked really hard to make this day possible. Um, I used to work a lot with young people, and it's it was really um, one of the most inspiring times of my life because I learned that when you give young people a chance to really voice their concerns um, and show how much they care about their community and also their concerns for the future, it is really inspirational and it's really powerful. So um, it's because of your guys' vision, your guys' hard work that we're here today. Um, and it's also you guys that really make me feel like we're going to be okay. So there's a lot of screwed up things happening in the world right now. And it's young people. When I talk to young people, I feel like, whew, we are going to be fine. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, so thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, it's Saturday morning, y'all. You could be <laughs> anywhere. And you chose to be here. So I just I really applaud your dedication to your community and, uh, in, at the least, a curiosity, which I think is a really great way to start. So we have uh, a little less than an hour. Um, I'm going to try to make this as interesting and interactive as possible. I know as students, you guys spend a lot of time being talked at and talked to. So I'm going to try to make this interesting and so we can move on to the most important part of the day, which is your voice. So the theme of this summit that you all decided on was free to be. So I think this is very telling. I think it says a lot about your perspective as young people. So this theme of free to be is important to you all because um, you probably don't feel very free. And specifically, you don't feel free to be yourselves. Um, so I just want to see a show of hands from folks. How many of you guys have ever been asked by an adult, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> Yeah, okay, pretty much everybody. So, yeah, that question brings a lot of feelings, right? Um, what, how about, how many of you guys have ever been asked by, let's say, a teacher, who do you want to be when you grow up? A couple of you, okay, great. I think this question of who do you want to be should be the essential question of our education system. And here's why. Um, when someone asks you what you want to be, this is a question about your vocation. So what? What you're going to be doing. And also it's about achieving, achieving things in the world. But the question about who you want to be is about your being, who you are in the world. And it's actually a question about your calling. So in order to get a calling, a calling calls you. Rather than you doing things, it requires that you really listen. So you can't hear a calling if you don't know how to listen for it. Still learning how to use this. So a lot of people ask me, um, you know, how I got to be where I am today. So I'm going to share with you how my story of how I went from 
um, asking myself about my vocation, what do I want to do, what do I want to be, to asking myself about what's my calling, what am I here to do, who do I want to be in the world. So in order to start this story, we're going to start from the beginning. So this is my immigration story. Uh, these handsome fellas here are my parents. This is them in China. So my parents were survivors of the Cultural Revolution. Um, this is under Mao's regime in China. So a lot of people don't know that this is one of the biggest uh, genocides that ever occurred on the planet. Um, the there, within four years, about 45 million people died of starvation. Um, so my parents actually, they grew up under those conditions. And I was actually born in China. So that's a picture of me with my parents in China. Um, here. Okay. I'm gonna go here. Okay, so this on the map is where I was born in Chongqing, China. Uh, when I was two years old, my mom got a visa. This was right in the time when China was just opening its doors to the West. So she was very, very fortunate. She was able to get a visa to come to Seattle, right here. So shortly thereafter, my dad followed her, and when I was four years old, I got my visa and I was able to come join them in the States. So this is me in the US. This is actually my first time up in the Space Needle um, and very happy to be reunited with my family. <coughs> so um, I grew up in what I would call a hyphenated experience. So I'm Chinese American, first generation. You see those hyphens? So I basically uh, spent my day going to school in America, and then I would go home to China. Oh. So <laughs> I basically existed in two completely different realities every single day. And sometimes the reality of America and the reality of China were so different that I couldn't reconcile those two differences. And I felt like this hyphen was literally a bar that was tearing me apart, pulling me in two opposite directions. It was actually cutting me in half. My identity was being fractured. So. Over time, I actually learned how this hyphen, this thing that's pulling me apart, could actually be a bridge. It's something that I can cross over. And how I came to this understanding was that I started creating my own hyphens. So I'm genderqueer. I don't ascribe to the gender binary. And I also consider myself a mystic nerd and more about that later. So I actually identify as a hyphen person. I identify as a hybrid, um, as a bridge person. So hyphenation, I think, is actually a superpower. Because you exist in multiple realities at the same time, it means you are interdimensional. You see things in ways that other people can't see them because you're used to existing in multiple truths all at one time. So I'm so excited that more and more young people are coming out as queer. Why? Because I don't think being queer is just a sexual orientation. I think it's actually an orientation to the world. It's a queer perspective. You're born with a queer way of looking at the world. And I think that's really beautiful and powerful. So who better to be an example of this than America Chavez? Has anybody heard of America Chavez? 
Uh, America Shaza. She is a uh, Marvel superhero. Mm -hmm. Superhero. She has a lot of powers. She can cross over between different dimensions. Uh, she has worked with A Force and the Young Avengers. Awesome. <laughs> She's also <laughs> thanks, Miranda. Bell, for being here. So she is an interdimensional being. She's also Marvel's first out and proud queer superhero. She's a Latina, and she literally punches holes through the fabric of space-time to fight Nazis. So she is very, very pertinent to the things that are happening in the world today. So when people ask me, how did I get to where I am? Um, I'm also an artist. Um, I come from this very, you could say, traditional background. So very traditional parents, a very traditional culture. How did I come to having this non-traditional career? And even in the world of artists, I'm considered a very non-traditional artist. I work in multiple mediums, and I never even went to school for art. Well, this took a little something called courage. Okay, so this is where my nerdiness comes in. <laughs> I'm a total word nerd. This is how I understand courage. So courage comes from the Latin word core, which means heart. So you can't have courage unless you have it in your heart. And then age, I think about age is time, right? So courage is something that develops in your heart over time. So when I was a teen, I thought one day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be confident. One day I'm going to have all my shit together and I'm going to be confident, confident, confident just everywhere all the time. Just one day it's going to happen. So I realized that confidence is something that you build only through living your life one moment at a time, meeting life's challenges, one obstacle at a time. And it, it takes time. And you are not gonna feel confident all the time ever. Right now, I'm, I'm nervous to be up here speaking to all of you, okay? So when I think about what, what are the times that I've felt courageous? How do I know I've been courageous? Well, I know I've been courageous because I've been scared, okay? I know I have courage when I am in fear. So let's talk a little bit about fear. So fear on the outside, or courage actually, on the outside looks like someone who is fearless, right? Just, no fear. <laughs> but courage on the inside is actually someone confronting their fear. It's someone who's scared and still moving forward, okay? So I want to tell you guys a little story about um, being scared. So when I was in my senior year of high school, I was living in the International District and I was mugged. And it was totally random, um, but I ended up in the hospital, and I had to undergo several very painful surgeries. And it took me out for several months. Um, and after that happened, I was like, okay, I'm just going to be strong. I'm going to forget all of this. I'm going to put it behind me. I'm not going to address it. It was totally random. It doesn't mean anything. Okay. And then, somehow, through life's funny events, and I didn't try to do this at all. I actually went to school for philosophy and history. Somehow, several years later, I ended up doing anti-violence work with young people. Okay, so a couple years down the road, I was like, wow, I'm actually doing anti-violence. How did this happen? Um, so this is a group of young people that I worked with through something called the Service Board. I'm not gonna tell you who I am in this picture, other than I'm wearing bright blue and I'm in the very front. <laughs> um, and I, I loved 
my job. Like I said, working with young people is one of the most uplifting things anyone can do. Um, working with young people filled me with hope every day. And it was actually during this time that I was doing anti-violence work that I was mugged again violently, and this time it was at gunpoint. So at this, the second time I was mugged, I couldn't brush it aside anymore. It made me confront the first time that I was mugged, all the fear, the pain, the anger, the sadness that was compounded in those two experiences. And so the second time that that happened to me, I began what I can only describe as my a mystical journey. And what I mean by this is that a mystic to me is someone who is in, in search of truth, okay? And truth with like a capital T. And what I mean by that is truth that is not just beautiful and light and feels good, but also truth that is painful, truth that is in the shadows, um, truth that can be dark. So I, you know, through a series of events, found myself having to confront my fears. Um, this is a picture of me actually living in the jungle, in the Amazon. Um, I was living with snakes, anacondas, wildcats. I didn't have walls in my hut. Um, and I was literally living in darkness, so there, were, there was no electricity. When um, nightfall came, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. You're just surrounded by the noises of the jungle at night. So I had to confront a lot of different kinds of fears. And what else was really profound during this time was I got to meet and work with a lot of mentors and healers who reminded me the importance of um, connecting to yourself. And not only connecting to yourself, but connecting to other people, connecting to each other, and also connecting to nature. So, what's interesting is that when you live in an urban environment, you experience a lot of disconnection. So, there's a lot of depression, loneliness. We're disconnected from ourselves. There's also a lot of, we're, we're super wired but are we really connecting to each other? There's social disconnection as well, right? And also, when you live in a city, not only are you disconnected from nature, in an urban environment, we're, we have to actively destroy nature to just exist in an urban environment. So there's so many oppressive forces that work on the individual, and it can feel like, how can you do anything about it, right? So. These forces seem like they're beyond our control. Um, and I knew that from my work with youth that violence happens because of oppression, because of all these forces. Um, I also, through my work, got to be introduced to the work of this guy, Augusto Boal. He created something called Theater of the Oppressed where during a military dictatorship in Brazil, he got young um, and poor uh, peasants, people who were illiterate, who couldn't read, to start a revolution through practicing the revolution in theater games. So they practiced real life scenarios through play, through acting. And he said that uh, oppression happens First and foremost, when people's imagination are taken from them. So this is the point where I started to piece the dots of my life together in a new way. I recognized a new calling that I had, which is to work with people to liberate them through the imagination, through helping people imagine a different future. We can't make that future unless we first imagine it, unless we free our minds, right? And I realized through my calling that this is something I wanted to do through creativity and through art. So, 
So I'm a mask maker. Uh, I love using masks to explore identity. So this is one way I help people connect to themselves through masks. You know, a mask can be something that you hide behind to protect yourself, protect your identity. It can also be a way for you to try on a new identity, right? Try on different ways of being. And also a way to connect with nature, too. So you can explore your spirit being, your spirit animals through masks. Um, and also take in, again, like I said, nature as an inspiration, different ways that our natural surroundings can help us awaken us to who we truly are. Um, I am also um, still consider myself an uh, east-west bridge person, so back to that hyphen. My Chinese heritage strongly influences my art. This is an installation that is based off of the I Ching, which is an ancient Chinese divination tool. So you actually go inside of it, and uh, there's a little well in the bottom, and you can ask a question to the well, and you will receive a reading that's based off the I Ching through animations and music. Um, another thing that I do, this is a collaboration between me and my partner. We take ancient Chinese myths and we turn it into a big show using dancing and puppetry and projected visual art um, to see how mythology, our heritage, can help us bring a new understanding to the issues that are at work today. Here's another video from a picture from that show. So I now live in the Bay Area. I've traveled to Mexico and China with my art. I, I want to continue to make my art international, to live in different places and share my art with the world. Um, but this took time for my family to acknowledge that this was an actual profession, OK? So it took a lot of years. And actually, now they're very proud. But this is where courage comes in, age, time. So even though my family was not supportive at first, I stuck to it. I really dedicated myself to this calling. I spent many years working, practicing. I didn't even go to school for art. So every technical thing I learned from art, I learned through practice, through mentors, through finding teachers. All right, I went to school for philosophy, which if you ask any career a uh, counselor or coach, it's like the worst thing you could major in because there's no jobs out there for you. But a uh, major in philosophy taught me how to see the world, how to read the world. Okay? It gave me a perspective and it gave me something to say with my art. And that you can actually apply to any field. Okay? If you have a perspective, you can apply that to anything you do. So, you know, now that my family's very proud of what I do, um, one of the things that, in the times when they weren't supportive, what really helped me through is understanding that I am living out the American dream that they had dreamed for me. Even if it's not exactly what they thought it was going to look like, I am being the fullest potential of who I could be. And that is why they worked so hard. That is why they sacrificed. So, you know, everywhere I take my art, everywhere I go, where I take my work, I carry with me their sacrifices, their hard work. I take them with me wherever I go. And that gave me courage, too. So this is the story of how I got to my calling. You could be asking now, so what, how, how do I get there? Okay, how do I find my calling? Well, I'm going to talk about a word that is not very popular when we think about a calling. <laughs> okay, and that is the word fate. So when we think of free to be, right, um, fate kind of goes against what we think about freedom. So we think fate is something that you end up with, right? If everything is predestined, Where's the freedom? So I'm going to share with you how 
Chinese people think of fate. So this is me, which in Chinese means fate or destiny. It's also the same word that means life, and the same word that means instructions. So for Chinese people, fate is not where you end up. It's not the end. Fate is the beginning. It's your instructions. Your life is the instructions that reveal your destiny. So another word nerd moment. The word weird. Where does the word weird come from? Well, the old English word weird spelled with a Y actually means fate and destiny. Okay, so if you combine mean with weird with the Y, and you ask, what's what's my what's my life instructions? What's my destiny? Well, it's what makes you weird. Okay? What makes you weird is your fate. Unfortunately, though, the things that make us weird oftentimes are the things that have hurt us. Okay? Whether it's being bullied, the unique struggles and challenges that you've had to go through, the hardships, the things that have, that have caused you pain, these are oftentimes the things that make us different. And they're also the very things that require fear and courage. So one of my favorite writers and activists, speakers, a woman named Carolyn Casey, says that trauma, the difficult things, the painful things, are actually your beautiful, dangerous assignment. Okay? This is another way to think about your life instructions. So it's dangerous because it causes us pain. And sometimes the traumas are so big, we could have perished, we could have died. I might not be here today because of those muggings. But it's also beautiful because through the things that hurt us, we find a way to give back to the world. We find a way to use that to help other people. So if we don't address our trauma, the things that hurt us, we can't become whole people to give back to the world. So if you're interested in a very inspiring story or book, um, Derek Jensen wrote a book called A Language Before Words. Derek Jensen's environmental activist, and he looks at the microcosm of the abuse that occurred in his family as a macrocosm for how we're abusing the planet. Okay, this book changed my life. So, we talked about fate as kind of the starting point, right, of your journey. This is the starting point of self discovery. So when we say free to be, free to be who exactly? Who am I? In order to answer this question of free to be who, you have to ask yourself some questions like, who do you want to be? Where do you come from? What do you believe in? What makes you weird? And how can you be of service? So one of the ways we can learn about ourselves is to read Okay. Um, I swear to God, your librarians did not put me up to this. <laughs> We're in the library. I really am a nerd and I love books. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to nerd out with you guys. Um, when I say read, I'm not just talking about books, though. I'm talking about learning to read your world. Okay. What are the stories that are being told? So internet, the TV, um, social media, magazines, these are all the stories of our time, okay? You can learn to read them like you're reading a novel. So what are the stories and whose stories are they? So when you think about a lot of the authors that maybe you're being asked to read in school or even the movies that we see um, in theaters, the directors, the authors tend to be white and they tend to be male. Okay, so I thought, hmm, this doesn't really represent who I am. 
And when I had this realization, I spent an entire year where I only read books written by women. Okay? I'm going to challenge you guys to try and do that and see if that changes your reality a little bit. Okay? And then after that, I spent an entire year reading only books written by uh, people of color, immigrant authors, other hyphenated people just like me. So I'm going to show you guys my little treasure trove, all right, of the books that changed my life. Some of you guys might be familiar with some of these, all right? So um, I'll, go, I'll go through these quickly. Octavia Butler, black sci-fi author. Um, Juno Diaz, deconstruct Deconstructing Toxic Masculinity, um, Maxine Hong Kingston, uh, Chinese talk story, first generation female uh, author, James Baldwin, black, queer, prophet, mystic, uh, visionary, Sherman Alexi, talking about the hyphen between Native American culture and being white, and uh, Sandra Cisneros, the hyphen between American and Mexican. Um, these are the books that have completely helped to shift my reality, change my reality. And many of these books have been banned in one form or another. So in order for you to discover who you are through reading, you might have to work a little bit. Um, these are the stories that people don't want to be told. Um, so, reading them, you're being kind of a rebel. So, what's another way for you to learn about yourself? It's to travel. Okay? Travel is how you get hyphenated. It's how you become interdimensional by experiencing realities that are not like your own. Um, there are scholarships out there, there are teachers, there are counselors that are out there to help you to make it possible for you to do this. And I actually think being a student is the best time in your life to travel because you have all the resources possible out there and you have the least amount of responsibility. Okay, now is the time. Get out there, surround yourself with people that are nothing like you. Um, and if your high school doesn't offer a chance to study abroad, apply to a college or a university that makes it easy for you to study abroad. That's what I did. So, how else do we learn about ourselves? We make mistakes, okay? I think making mistakes is a sign that you are discovering yourself. And I'm going to right now share a little secret as an adult to young people. That as adults, we're just making it up all the time. Okay? None of us really know what we're doing. We're mostly just chasing rabbits down rabbit holes and hoping for the best. Okay? So, as an adult, what you're doing is you play a role, and as an adult, you forget that you are playing. So as young people, this is my advice to you, don't forget to play, alright? And that's why mistakes are in these little bunny quotations, because when you're playing, there's no such thing as a mistake. There's only exploration and discovery. And also, when you're in a state of play, your sense of happiness and your sense of success is self-generated. It comes from in here. It's not based off of a job or a teacher or an employer. Those things are going to change, 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 change throughout your life. Okay? And your calling is going to change, just like mine did, throughout your life. So the only way to figure out what that calling is, is to play around with it. So, when you're exploring yourself, traveling, reading, trying new things, is that automatically going to lead to my calling? 
Well, not necessarily. I'm going to ask you guys this. When we say free to be, why? Like, what's the point of freely being who you truly are if you don't give back to the world, right? If you don't help contribute, if you don't be of service, So I think your calling is a combination of discovering who you truly are and then connecting that back to the world. So remember the things that made us weird, the things that might have been painful for us, the things that were challenges. Well, those traumas, those difficult things are connected to the traumas of our time. All right. So let's actually look at what's going on in your generation right now. So I had to do a little bit of research. I learned that you guys are iGens or Gen Zs, which I didn't know about. I thought millennials were still the, the newest thing. Wait, what's an iGen? <laughs> so, <laughs> iGen, Gen Zs, as they call y'all. Um, you guys were the first people, first generation ever, to be born with the internet. So born in 1995, I think, or later. Okay? You've never known a time without the interwebs. Um, this is a book that is written by a sociologist and academic about iGens. Why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. That's what they're saying about y'all. So, in order for us to look at what's going on here, let's let's just kind of explore what is the fate of your generation. And so, what I mean by that is, what's the starting point? What have you guys inherited? So, the millennials came before you. This is Generation Me. Um, you know, selfie generation. But we can even go a little further back and look at a deeper timeline of what you inherited. All right, so baby boomers, civil rights era, counterculture. These things really brought racism, sexism to light. If you keep looking at what else you've inherited over time, distrust in politicians, nuclear war, gun violence, terrorism, and an economic system that is not just in a re recession, but is actually unsustainable. And also, the internet. <laughs> the internet can be blamed for the narcissism epidemic that you guys are living in right now. Um, celebrity culture is everywhere. It leads to unreal expectations. You guys have the highest rate of depression, suicide, loneliness existing right now. So you are born into a mental health crisis. Um, because y'all are super connected, wired online, you spend less time face to face, which leads to loneliness. Um, so these are some of the stats. I'm going to share with you guys why I think you guys are the most promising generation. Right? Why I think you guys are the most hopeful. And here's why. So you're the most ethnically diverse. You can look at this fancy little chart. So you're, you guys are on the tipping point critical mass to majority minority. So only 53% of your peers are white. Um, also, there's the lowest religious participation, which means that fundamentalism is going to be less of a problem for your generation. You're the most tolerant of difference. So whether it's sexual orientation, uh, different kinds of gender, ethnic diversity, you guys show the highest amount of tolerance. And you're the least tolerant of societal norms. So marriage institutions, um, uh, gender uh, norms, 
also, uh, you guys are very pro the legalization of drugs. And there's more of you guys that identify as queer than straight. So only 48% of iGens or Gen Zs identify as exclusively heterosexual compared to 65% of millennials age 21 to 34. All right? So you guys think that the gender binary is much less sleek than millennials do. <laughs> So looking at all of this, what's going on in these times in your generation, the specific strengths and problems that are unique to your generation, you can ask, well, how can I, as an individual, make a difference, right? So the iGen, you guys are the first generation to be named after a corporation. I think it's time for you guys to take that back, okay? <laughs> iGen can mean I for imagination. Generation that can imagine a new future and help take us there. We need people to imagine a different world, a different reality now more than ever. I'm also gonna share with you guys something that my teacher told me. So I have a, a teacher, Chinese, very, uh, uh, she's a very spunky, awesome uh, dancer, choreographer, and she always says this. She says, for a scientist, one plus one equals two. For an artist, one plus one equals infinity. Okay, so what I think she means is that artists see the world symbolically. Okay, that if you combine any two things, you have infinite possibilities. Right? And that's another way to look at the hyphen. The two things coming together, the hyphen is a plus sign. It creates any possibilities. And that's really what magic is. Magic is anything is possible, right? So I'm going to do a little exercise with you guys to show you that magic is real. Okay? So you guys want to do this? Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys to stand up. Okay, so I'm actually going to ask maybe the first row to come uh, further to the front a little bit so we have a little bit of room. And then people in the back row can kind of scoot back a little bit. So yeah, don't be shy, it's okay, I won't. Right? Um, so I just want you guys to kind of move your arms around a little bit and just make sure that you're not going to hit anyone when you turn around in all directions. All right? Okay, great. Beautiful. So this is what I'm going to have you guys do. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our right arm and hold it up directly in front of us and point your point your finger out, point straight ahead, okay? And I want you to plant your feet very firmly on the ground, right? And so our feet are not going to move. We're slowly going to turn to our right, so just turning our torso, the feet don't move. We're taking our arm all the way around, swinging it back, as far as we can go, still looking at where we're pointing till you reach your limit where you can't go any further. Okay, so pointing with that finger, turning all the way, all the way to the right. So you should be looking behind you. And now you're at your limit. Look at where you're pointing and take a mental snapshot of your limit where you can't go any further. Okay, now you can relax, put your arm down, shake it out a little bit. <laughs> Alright. So now we're going to do the very same thing, but only in our minds, using only our imagination. Okay. So keep your arms to your side. I want you to close your eyes. 
And I want you to imagine in your mind's eye, you're pointing straight ahead, your arm raised. And imagining now you're slowly turning to the right, turning, 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 just imagining this, turning until you see that snapshot of your limit where you couldn't go any further. And now, in your imagination, you're going to go beyond that. You're going to go further, further. All right. Now, you open your eyes, and we're going to do it. All right. So, raise your arm, point straight ahead, and now slowly turn to the right. Turning, keeping your feet firmly planted. We're going to turn and turn, reaching to where our limit was before, and now we're going to go further. We're going to go beyond that. We're going to go past that point where you couldn't go before last time. All right, now relax. How many of you guys went beyond where you were before? Whoa, that's like every single person in the room. All right, so give yourselves a pat in the back. <laughs> you massage your, your back, your muscles, your arm a little bit. Go back to your seat. <laughs> so, the reason why we did this exercise is because I want to show you that magic is real, okay? And what I mean by magic is taking the power of imagination, the power to imagine, and then turning that into action, making it happen. That's magic, right? So remember Augusta Boyle said, your imagination is the key to freedom. If you can imagine a new world, you can do it, you can make it happen. So, you might still be wondering, okay, so if I just use my imagination, if I just help others, is that actually enough? There's so many problems in the world today that the amount of stress, the amount of oppression is just so huge. How can I, as a single person, make a difference? So I'm going to share with you guys a little story. It's called The Hundredth Monkey. So there's a group of monkeys called macaques in uh, Japan. And scientists were watching them, and they found that there was a family of monkeys that they started doing a funny thing, which is before they eat sweet potatoes, they would actually wash them in the water. So that's something that scientists have never observed before. And then they kept watching over the years. So, you know, the way monkeys pass on uh, these unique behaviors is they pass it on, each one teach one. You know, this guy teaches this person, all right, dad teaches the son, the son teaches the cousin. And then slowly over the years, the monkeys all learn this new behavior. Well, as they continued to do this observation, they found that there was a critical point where, let's say, the hundredth monkey learned this behavior. All of a sudden, this behavior started to pop up spontaneously, spreading like wildfire through many, many family groups. Family groups that were isolated, too. They had no way of communicating with each other. And they couldn't figure out how this was possible. They call this the hundredth monkey phenomenon. That once something reached a critical point, it just spreads. So Rumi, Rumi is a mystic poet, one of my favorite poets. He also talks about something called the last 30 pound veil. So his actual quote is, love is the last 30 pound veil. The last bail you put on the cart before the cart tips over. All right. 
So why am I sharing this with you guys? You guys are the tipping point generation. 53% white, more queer than straight. You guys are at critical mass right now, okay? So the thing about the 100th monkey or the last 30 pound bale is that we need every single monkey, we need every pound of bale to reach that point where change happens, okay? So, I'm going to challenge you guys to live every day as if you might be that hundredth monkey. You might be that last 30 pound bale. Right? And that's how change happens. Thank you.